second Sunday after Pentecost is from the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons or daughters, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light to shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The rest of the album. <laughs> Colossians, the second chapter. 
when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailed it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. But dear brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, we have entered into, and I see a couple of people here who were here yesterday, so I'm going to alter my sermon a little bit for them. But we heard uh, last week that we have now entered into the time of the church. And so the time of the church is a time of teaching, right? So the first two parts, the time of Christmas and time of Easter, focus on events in the life of our Lord, his saving activities on our behalf. And then this whole long period we're going to go through until we get to Advent, the time of the church, focuses then on the teachings of our Lord. And we saw how Luke does the very same thing in Acts where he says he told everything about what Jesus had did and what he taught. So the church has, with her calendar, developed a way to do that same thing. Everything he did and everything he taught. And on this second Sunday after Pentecost, the first one was the Trinity, a pretty important teaching of the church, how God has revealed himself to us. Now we turn to uh, how God desires for us to be obedient and what that looks like in the Christian life. Uh, you heard it when we began here that the theme is the obedience of kingdom people. And so, and that for the Christian is important. The Christian, because he has the Holy Spirit, because the new man is in him, even though the old man's still there clinging to him the day he dies, in the new man, insofar as he's new man, with the Holy Spirit, he desires to do what is good, to be obedient in every possible way that the Lord would out of thankfulness for what Christ has done for him, for the salvation that God has wrought through sending his son to pay for our sins. And so, if you're a Christian, you desire to be obedient to our Lord and to his teachings. And, but sometimes we have to look really closely at the text to see what that obedience looks like for us in our given context at our given time. After all, there is an Old Testament, and there is a New Testament. The obedience of God's kingdom people in the Old Testament looked somewhat different than it looks for us in the New Testament. I don't know about you, but I like eating BLTs. If I'd been in the Old Testament, and to be obedient to God, I wouldn't be able to do that. But because I'm a New Testament Christian, I can in obedience eat a BLT with joy in my heart and thankfulness to God, I get to eat a BLT for his goodness and mercy for first article gifts, right? And so things do change. We ought to know that between the Old and New Testament. In fact, that idea of food, and that's why one of the reasons I chose that Colossian passage, right, where Paul says, don't let anybody judge you about what you eat or drink. Any Jew hearing that knows all about in the Old Testament being obedient to what you, without regard to what you eat and you drink, right? Because you didn't eat any pork. Your Old Testament part of Israel, that part. But if you're before Israel in the Old Testament, it's a different story. In fact, the scriptures make known to us that God changed his requirements and his minds a couple times. So that our first parents, and up until the flood, they were supposed to eat only vegetables. No meat. I couldn't eat out of BLT, I couldn't have any meat. But after the flood, God says, now everything that has life and breath in it can be yours for food. He changed the rules. But when he creates Israel, his nation, his chosen people, that are to be a witness to the world, he changes the rules again. They can eat meat, but not pork. Only certain meat. Clean and unclean law. And now in the New Testament,
blessed it. We're back to whatever you receive with thanksgiving. We're back again. So God does and has, it's very clear, everything from uh, the fact that there's an Old New Testament, from the fact of the food itself, that God does change the rules sometimes, depending on our context and our circumstances and what's necessary for our salvation and for the proclamation of his glory. And we should be aware of that. That's an important interpretive key, guys. Because a lot of people think God can't change the rules, and so if you say he's changed the rules, they get all real worried and upset. And they think you're being disobedient. But they're not reading the text real closely. To see, yeah, he has. He does. That's important. This morning we heard uh, from the Old Testament lesson to remember the Sabbath day. To observe it. How does that look for us in the New Testament? It looked one way for God's people Israel. Um, Deuteronomy 5, and again in Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments are given. But in each case, it is clearly given, the text says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to Israel, to his covenant people of the Old Testament. And it's very telling that that is not given again in the New Testament when he creates his new people, the church. Is new Israel, based on the true Israel, Christ. Remember, anybody who's connected, whether you're in the Old Testament or New Testament, distinctions but don't divorce, right? When you're in the Old Testament or New Testament, you're Israel only if you're connected to the Messiah, who is Israel. But now, to anyone who's connected to it, whether it be Jew or Gentile, you will make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, and so how does this apply to us? In what shape, form? Yeah. We hear this. Because after all, it was the Old Testament reading. Right? By the way, the gradual, that little ditty we sing in between the, the Old Testament and the Epistle, right? The gradual refers to a step. With that, we acknowledge, the priest used to acknowledge, he would step up a step to read the, the Epistle and the Gospel lesson, which was a reminder of what? We're not in the Old Testament anymore. And even though the Old Testament still teaches us, it's still God's word, it still proclaims the coming Messiah is very valuable for us, well, it's the Old Testament. It's not the New Testament. Okay. So how does it apply? Well, it's interesting that Christians who have tried to be obedient to their Lord, and we must give them credit for that, because that's what we all should try to do as Christians, right? Have understood this differently. One understanding is Rome's understanding. The Roman Catholic Church has uh, said, well, the church worships on Sunday, not on Saturday anymore, because the Sabbath was Saturday. Okay. And she says, uh, and this happened because the Pope changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And see the power of the Pope. He's the vicar of Christ on earth. He can change the rules. Now, we want to give them credit for their recognition and acknowledgement that things can be different in the Old and the New Testament. That's a good thing, right? But nowhere does the scripture say anything like that. In fact, the truth of the matter is that Christians began to worship on Sunday already within New Testament times. You see it, for example, in the term the Lord's Day. And I don't know if you noticed when, when we're singing these hymns, notice there, the title of is Lord's Day, right? Which is Sunday. In fact, in Greek, the Lord's Day is still a term for Sunday. The Greek people, still that term. Okay. Uh, they already were starting to worship on Sunday in commemoration of the resurrection. Jesus rising from the dead on a Sunday. In fact, remember in the early church there was a debate. Did we do it on the day where it falls in the Jewish calendar, or do you do it on Sunday? Because it doesn't always fall on a Sunday in the Jewish calendar. Or do you do it on Sunday? And ultimately, the churches, all the churches pretty much went to, you do it on Sunday, to honor the resurrection. Okay. Uh, and so, the early Christian church began to do this pretty early on, to worship on Sunday, to make the move from Saturday to Sunday. But it's not because of hope. It's not like, uh, was it uh, Al Gore said he invented the internet? Um, <laughs> You know, the Pope does this, right? The church does stuff, and then the Pope says, oh, that was my idea. Well, no. No, it, was, it predates it, right? Making the sign of the cross. 
People ask Roman Catholic. Oh, really? It's been around since 100 AD. Yeah, the Pope claims it, but he claims everything. Doesn't make it a bad thing. It's not a cross. It's a good thing. Good Christian tradition. Good Christian tradition. Nothing wrong with it. And, by the way, or as we're going to see here, that Sunday is a good Christian tradition. The other way of handling this, of course, the issue of the Sabbath, is what most Protestants tend to do. And they say, well, no, God changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And again, there's a recognition, well, again, we're thankful there's a recognition of what? That things are different between the Old and New Testament, and God can change his mind, and he can change your requirements. That's a good thing, that they understand that, recognize that. The problem with it, it doesn't say that in the Bible. Nowhere does it say that. And in fact, the third possibility, the Sabbatary possibility, that Saturday is still the Sabbath, and it still applies as it did in the Old Testament to every believer, is not a stupid option, but actually a very obedient option. I mean, you heard Deuteronomy, didn't you? Right? Yeah. The problem with that option is, though, it fails to see the move from the Old to the New Testament from the shadow to the reality. From what point forward to Christ Jesus himself. From the coming Messiah and being prepared for him to the one we confess as Lord and Savior. That's what Paul's getting at in Colossians. In fact, I think when he mentions the Sabbath day last, that's kind of the big one. You know, the mic drop. Because if the Sabbath has been fulfilled in Christ, then that changes everything with regard to the Old Testament and the New Testament and the relationship. And now you know this, that everything in the Old Testament, everything was pointing to Jesus. This is what Jesus tells them on the road to Emmaus, for example, when he opens the scriptures to explain them. They're all about me, guys. And the Sabbath is. Now, if I didn't understand that interpretive mood, I would, to be an obedient person to our Lord, I would keep Sabbath. Just like I would keep circumcision. Because both are an eternal covenant, the Bible says. And when Paul has to argue this interpretive move that I'm making here, he has to deal with texts. And texts that predate Moses. Because it's always, well, the Sabbath predates Moses. Yeah, so does circumcision. And which is more important? There's also a hierarchy here, right? Are you aware that on the Sabbath, right? And so that's one command. The other command is um, to circumcise your children. You know what day? The eighth day. Why the eighth day? What's up with that? And if that, by the way, if that eighth day falls on the Sabbath, which gave in to which? Did you wait to the ninth day to circumcise and avoid work? work and do that work of circumcision even if fell on the Sabbath. The Sabbath gave way to circumcision. And why the eighth day? Because it's the whole thing of what the, all the numbering is really about, I think, in Scripture. Right? The eighth day. How many days did God create? Six days He created the world. The seventh day He rested. The eighth day is the new creation. God Redoing stuff. Restoring stuff. Bringing it back to the way it's supposed to be. Right? And so they were circumcised the eighth day. And by the way, do you notice the number of sides on that font right there? It just happens to be eight. But it doesn't just happen to be eight. Because this is where, again, recreation is beginning. Where new life is starting. And this happened with the baptism. And this makes sense then, too, by the way. And, and you'd be aware that um, Genesis text, right? In Genesis where it says, where God says he rests on something. This is written by Moses. Now, this is significant. So I always tell people, what's the oldest Bible book in the Bible? People say, Genesis. It's probably Job. 
Why do I say that? Because Job has probably the most archaic Hebrew. And remember, Genesis was written by Adam and Eve? No, it was written by Moses. Years after Adam and Eve. Inspired under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I'm not challenging that in one bit, but making the point of time here, right? You know? And so I think Moses, who is part of God's people, right? Israel, right? He's the leader, right? He's explaining why God wants it to be the seventh day. Not that it's been going on before that. In fact, it's an interesting thing. You don't hear of the Sabbath in the book of Genesis other than there. Not once. Not once. Because I think it's given to Israel. In fact, in, here, in this particular one, in Exodus, it gives the account that it's given because of um, the seventh day of rest. But here it's because remember that you were slaves in Egypt. And that the Lord your God brought you out with a mighty hand. And so he's giving the rationale, I argue, in Genesis. Not that it's been going on for all this time. Or something. But why? Well, for six days you worked. And the seventh day you rested. For six days you are reminded of the fall. What's the big thing for the male in the curse? You will earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. And the ground will give you thorns and thistles. Now, by the way, they were going to work, but now it's going to be hard. It's a fallen world. For six days, you're reminded of that fall. Every, during the week, have you reminded of the fall? And the more stuff we create, more technology breaks. Uh, my, my favorite saying is technology, it's great when it works. Oh, we still live in a fallen world. It doesn't always work. Six days, you're reminded of the fall. The seventh day was rest. And you're pointed forward to that great day when the Messiah, he who brings rest, will come. And Jesus says what? Come on to me, all your heavy laden and burden. And I, and I will give you rest. The Sabbath, as great as it was, as wonderful it was, was a type, was a shadow. The reality is found in Jesus. And so we really, as Christians, don't have a Sabbath day. We have a Sabbath person. Christ. Christ. And if you're connected to him, then you will be connected in a great Sabbath when we see him face to face and when he restores everything completely and totally. And we need to be part of that. How cool is that? But that is the one understanding, I think, that makes sense of tying the two Testaments together, and Christologically so, in our Savior. And it's a wonderful thing, because it's what? Again, pointing us to where our certainty is to be found. Our Lord desires us to have this rest, not just from the fall of the world, but from the, our own fallenness. Because we're reminded of that, too. Cut that guy off getting in the parking lot. I lost, uh, lost my temper with the kids. Whatever it may be. Wherever, wherever sin raises its ugly head, and it does, and that's because we're sinners, as we confessed a few moments ago, Jesus gives us rest. And the promise that that will be taken away someday. Completely. Totally. But until then, he gives us his means of grace that we would find that rest and receive it. He gives it to us in the waters of holy baptism where he places his name upon you that you might have certainty to know that you have been claimed by Christ. A few moments ago we heard it in the absolution that is spoken that you might know. And then even in a more personal way, a second, in the body and blood of Christ that we place in your mouth. And you will find rest. And I will raise the chalice and the host and I will say the peace of the Lord. Always. And for now, it's found in that chalice. Peace. The rest. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Now, may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus always.